Right, you're asking about the story of Rebel Inc, Jenny. Yep. This is where it begins. Muir House, Muir House Shopping Centre and Muir House Library. I think 1991, myself, Duncan McLean and a few other writers we started meeting here in Muir House Library. Well, in the early 90s, I stayed over in West Pilton and they used to come to readings here in Muir House. They used mm -hmm. to put on different readings. And one night they had a Jim Kelman was promoting the burn. From that reading, Duncan McLean started a writer's group here in Muir House Library I used to go to. We'd meet, we'd talk literature, but Duncan was based here as Clock Tower Press. Duncan was doing like just poetry and short stories, but I was thinking of something like a magazine, like a big A4 glossy magazine that would be kind of look like a glossy magazine you get in a newspaper, but it'd actually be a hard hitting literary fanzine. I was talking over with them at the same time. So this is where the idea germinated from. When I was doing Rebel Inc, I was permanently went about with this bag full of magazines, trying to hustle shops, record shops, bookshops, And what are they take it, wouldn't they? They put it on the front desk back then. Yeah, I mean, when we started off, it was a hard sell. We had to get three or four copies in. Mm. As it progressed, by issue four, they were ordering 50 copies and putting it right next to the till, which is impossible now yeah. because you have to buy that space. But they were so enthusiastic, yeah. they'd phone us up, could we get another 50? Yeah. And it was selling that quick yeah. by the time we got to issue four and five of the magazine. I was quite ambitious. I was publishing over a thousand copies in the magazine. Yeah. Uh, whereas now a literary magazine, you'd never sell a thousand copies because you can't get the distribution. And by, and by denying the distribution, what it means is that those diverse voices don't have so many avenues to get through because they have to go through the mainstream. Totally. And your whole thing was, mm. fuck the mainstream and fuck London. So mm. what, was, what was that about? Yeah. What well, was that, that about, Kevin, eh? <laughs> was just where I kinda, that's where I was. I was like, fuck London. You know, cause it's but what did it mean? What did fuck London mean? Fuck London mean? meant it's like we had just gone through, like 1992, we had just been through 13 years of Thatcher's rule. Yeah. And then we got them I back again. I remember it very well. I mean, the Tories won the election again in 92, the week before we brought the first issue of Rebel Inc out, we thought they were gone. But yeah. They were like, fucking, they were like, what's their name? And Fatal Attraction, to come back for more. And it's like, okay, how do we cope with this? We're gonna have to deal with this uh, culturally. But in the UK in particular, we've been very dominated by the idea that literature is elite. So when you were saying, fuck the mainstream, mm. this was also about class on a of different course. level. I mean, this is like, for us to have a conversation is unusual, because we both come from working class backgrounds. Yeah. Now, most people who discuss literature don't come from working class backgrounds that get featured in the kind of media and such like. But back then, class was so important, because the writers who were influencing us, you know, James Kellum and Alistair Gray and that were from working class backgrounds, mm -hmm. and they were expressing and articulating the experiences of working class people. And that was like central to what we did with Rebel Inc. You know, literature supposed to be, for some people, it's supposed to be innervating and enlightening and illuminating and transcendental. Yeah. That's not the way people live their lives, you know, and literature has to reflect and on much broader things than some kind of like middle class, semi-religious idea mm. of innervating and illuminating people's lives. It has to be, you know, I feel it had to be grayer. It had to reflect what was happening in the housing schemes and football terracing and the pubs, clubs and, and all the rest of it. And a whole bunch of stuff came through at once, whereas at the moment there's a constant debate about where are the working class writers. Mm. I hate the idea of class full stop, but we're still mm. in a position where any any voice that's different is struggling to get published, probably more so than when all these came through at the same time. So that just must have been a really, really exciting time. Mm. It books. was. I mean, it's, your, your, your story is an exception rather than the rule. It's totally an exception. And, um, it's, and it's, it's got worse. I think it's got worse. I, I, think, think, I think you had a mm. moment in time. And um, why are we not seeing mm. that now? But this is the office I used to work in in the early 90s. I ran a community newspaper called Tall Cross Times. Oh, this is tiny, is it? It's a tiny little office. There's five of us worked in here. We shared it with the community education. They're still here, as you can see, hard at work. And they were based out here. And I ran the Tall Cross Times from inside, but it was getting closed down. The council were shutting down some of the community newspapers. And I'd started working on an idea for a literary magazine. And so I did a competition in the Tall Cross Times, send in your short stories. And we got a whole bunch of them. Duncan McLean, Gordon Legg judged it. And this, it was in here, sitting here, that I read you know, the first extract from Irvin's book, Train Spotting, uh, and it just fucking collapsed laughing, gave it to Sharon, who was sitting there, she was her sales out, she's reading it, and we're all reading this out, think, fuck, this is brilliant. So I quickly got on the phone here and said to Duncan McLean, do you know who this guy Irvin Welsh is? I really want to get him published in uh, the first issue of Rebel Inc. And he goes, yeah, I know him, he got in touch with us, he's got some stories going. So uh, I got Irvin's phone number, he also worked for the council at the housing department in Waterloo Place. So I said to him, send as much stuff as you can. So he sent me a whole lot of short stories that were going to become in train spot. And he said, well, just use whatever you want for the magazine. So I went for the longest one and I met Irvin. That's how I really first came in touch with Irvin Welsh. You know, we'd be sort of drank in the same pubs and everything, but I didn't really know him up until that point. So he was yeah. sending out short stories at that point and mm -hmm. yeah. hitting different places. And I was, the reason I worked in Tall Cross Times, but we got money from the council, the regional council, to, that paid for it. But I was running front page stories telling people not to pay their poll tax. So they fucking relaxed and the newspaper <laughs> and got rid of me from yeah. the job. 
hardly surprising when you think back on it, but that was just the way it turned out. And I used the redundancy money the last three weeks' wages to pay for the printing of Rebel Inc. number one okay. from here. It was like three weeks' wages. It was about 700 quid or something like that, 6 to 50, and that so paid for the... So essentially it was founded by the council. <laughs> 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 Sacking you off. Sorry. And then you just start something bigger instead. <laughs> Aye, right. From the story point of view, we got a whole batch of short stories. They all came in in December 91, and that was it. I was going to use them as the basis for... Rebel Inc. magazine. They were going to be the core of all the short stories. But I went out on a Christmas night out and I lost them all in a pub, got pished. <laughs> so we had no content for Rebel Inc. issue one. It was like, that was it. So I thought, oh fuck. So I woke up with a hangover, went uptown, trying to cover my footsteps, every pub I'd been in the night before. I should do. And I found them in Bennett's bar. <laughs> I can't even remember being in Bennett's bar. And I found the little bag of all the content that was to be Rebel Inc. number one in Bennett's bar on the day before Christmas Eve. You know, I could tell the story of Rebel Inc. as if it was some master plan, but it wasn't. But nobody has a master plan. No, it was just all, it was all winging it. Everything's but winging it. Every one of those people you know? influenced you to do what you were doing. Every one of those people is a part of, do you know what I mean? Sandy Craigie yeah. is a part of how you ended up doing Rebel Inc. You know, Paul having a big, you know, knowledge of counterculture. You going along in your house library. All of those events are just as a single event at a single event, but when you plot them together, they take you on a journey that leads you to something. You've got to keep your ears open and your eyes and just be aware of what people are recommending to you and just follow it up and find out where the leads go, you know? Wellington Place. Wellington Place. Leith Links. This black door has a quite an important role in what I did with Rebel Inc and also in Scottish literature because behind that black door, two flights up, is where Irvin Welsh lived and wrote Train Spotting. Why isn't there a blue plaque? Why is there no fucking blue plaque? Where's this the blue is the plaque? Where is the blue plaque? We have How blue these, plaques to writers everywhere. You know, there should be one there. Irvin Welsh lived here and wrote Train Spotting up on that second floor. What happened was, if you look at the first three issues of Rebel Inc. They're quite sort of political. On the front of issue three, it's got Malcolm X standing there at the window with a gun. I wanted it to be provocative because I was quite socialist, anarchistic, Marxist. And then what happened was I read Irvin Welsh's train spotting. It wasn't yet published. And I said, I'll meet you, Irvin. I want to, I want to meet you to talk over this. I want to get the first interview with you before you do any more interviews with anyone. But I want to do it a bit different. I want us to take an ecstasy first to do your first interview and we'll tape record it on ecstasy. I'd never taken ecstasy before, but Irvin went clubbing. So I thought, okay, that sounds like a good idea. So we took it up there, next, you know, bang, bang, bang. Two months later, I started working on issue four of Rebel Inc. But this time Malcolm X is out the window and this is where I decided to get the front cover of me and Irvin's tongues with an E on it. And it became very iconic, issue four. And the whole of issue four was influenced by drugs and drugs culture, there's no doubt about it. It was very psychedelic, the writing was psychedelic. Everything had changed from issue three. And in that way, I think that Rebel Inc moved up a few gears. You know, when I went to clubs in the 1990s, we felt like we'd found something. And we felt like we'd found something that was based on love. And we'd just come out of the 1980s, which was the most materialistic decade. Holy, Paul Ricky called it the, these, the chill out rooms were the new boot camps of interaction, you called it. <laughs> in his own inimitable way. <laughs> and there was an you know, there was a truth Completely. in that. You chill out rooms, you sat and you talked about everything. Yeah. You know, music, poetry, love, sex, the revolution, whatever, all these things were happening in the chill out rooms at clubs. You just kind of wish that feeling was now. You wish people, people who are younger had that feeling of, you know, there's an optimism in there. Things can be done to make things better. That's kind of gone. And now it's a total back against the wall political thing and people feel under threat. You know. But they don't want people to come together in the same way. You know, you had the, the, the legislations against marching. You yeah. had the legislations against more than eight people meeting in a public place. You know, the, <laughs> the state hates all the that. The state idea hates of all of that. And if you look at yeah, exactly, if you together. look at the internet now, what they want is everybody sitting at home staring at a box yeah. while the box stares back at them. It's divide and conquer. It's a panopticon. Mm. It's a it's a thing that we weren't dealing with actually. Mm. You know, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Is that if you're involved as a young person in literature and culture, you've got to create spaces. Yeah. You've got to work with other people, find other people, fellow travellers and create spaces that's not just for promoting your writing yeah. or your friend's writing but creating spaces where I be filled by ideas that can yeah. disperse into whatever direction they need to go in you know right the temporary autonomous zone was a theory come up by Hackham Bay in the 1980s he's one of the first internet anarcho philosophers okay. and his theory of temporary autonomous zone where you carve out an area of freedom yeah. where the laws of the state no longer apply okay so if you had to keep them moving because they were temporary because okay. as soon as you tried to make it permanent, the state would close it down. Yep. So what we tried to do was, we tried to create a temporary autonomous zone here, Red Light Night Cafe. Yeah. As soon as the doors were shut, we did whatever the fuck we want, basically. Yeah. Uh, we did the poetry readings, we had one night, there's an S&M poet who was kind of whipping somebody on the floor. Irvin Welsh read here, Alan Warner read here, Paul Ricky, Laura Hurd, Gordon Legg, Sandy Craigie, they all read in here. For the, We only ran it for four or five months. Yeah. And we did that in there because we were attracting people from the 
the music industry and everybody and it was getting so busy in there you couldn't cram any more people in yeah no mobile phones no twitter it's all word of mouth after the fifth month we we, we launched rebel Inc. issue five in here right which was the very last magazine yeah. we did yeah. in 94 yeah. and that was the end of that whole phase of rebel Inc. the, the, okay. the date yourself magazines and publishing it was in here. It was an amazing thing. People still talk about it as if they, you know, yeah. they remember it because yeah. it was very special. Yeah. Anyway, that's what we used to do here. Proper writers community. So why did you all meet at Robbie's? Well, we all we kind of lived here. I lived in that flat up there. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Ricky lived in the flat across there. Yeah. It was a kind of tight. Irvin lived down the road. Leith Walk was always kind of central to everything, and all the writers kind of congregated around Leith. Writers just didn't meet with writers. Yeah. Because that's crap. It's Leith, we're part of the Leith community, we're feeding off what's happened around the years. So, Alan Warner got in touch with this uh, journalist from the New York Times and said there was a whole scene in Edinburgh, this is 1996, Trainspot was just about to come out yeah. as a movie, and he said there was this whole scene, and it was like the beatniks of New York, of, of San Francisco, you know, like Kerouac and Burroughs and all that. But and in we Edinburgh. Were, we were like, hi, was, was it fun? But <laughs> it was a good kind of spin to it, and it was a really good journalist, Leslie Downer, came up. And this photographer took photographs of Irvin, Duncan McLean, myself, Gordon Legg, and we're all sitting there looking at beautiful photographs. And it appeared in the New York Times magazine as the Beats of Edinburgh. And all of a sudden, we got inundated with like offers to go to America, all sorts of things. So it kind of exploded at that point. I was just starting Reveling as a publishing house for Canningate. And so uh, it became a mecca for all these daft Americans coming over Robbie's going, mecca. where's all the beatniks? Where's all the beatniks? <laughs> and it's just all the usual like JK that. sitting there with their half and half. Like. Right. Anyway, I went over to America and the idea was to find writers for Rebel Inc. And it was just a, you know, a remit. Who Go. sent you? Canongate? Uh, no, it was myself. You sent yourself yeah. to New York I to look for writers? I wanted American writers, so I went over there. It just kind of panned out and I did meet, I did find writers. So your tactic was go to pubs, oh. get drunk <laughs> and meet writers and it worked. And I found them. I actually woke up and after going to a party in America and I was lying flat, there was a photograph and I'd been out all night and I had a book on my back and it was Jim Dodge's fup. I never heard of John Jim Dodge. That's how I found Jim Dodge. He was lying on my back one morning <laughs> in a flat in New York. By the time I was working with novels and non-fiction, I, I felt I had a good instinctive grasp of what an editor's job was. Not a passive editor, but an active editor who'd fight with the authors and make suggestions and say, no, this doesn't work, or change the ending, or even the title. And, you know, you'd have that kind of thing. Uh, and you say you'd fight with them, but you were also really generous and encouraging them. You know, Laura Hurd said she submitted her first short story to you and that you were really encouraging. And essentially, she said there was a whole period where she was just writing short stories to send them along to you because she didn't have anybody else reading them. I didn't publish Laura's first story that she sent me, but I remember reading it thinking, wow there's yeah. something here that I've not read before and I think I wrote about a four page letter back to her and then she sent me some more stuff that's nice and Laura stuck that's with nice us thing to do. she stuck with us until I eventually edited and published her with Canning Gate her first collection of short stories and her novel Born Free I worked as the editor on that and saw her go from somebody sending a story just a two page short story that wasn't quite ready for publication to being an important writer yeah you know you meet people and you find things and that's the whole joy of publishing at a grassroots exciting. level. It must have been exciting being in your office oh, and things totally. dropping through the door and yeah. you know finding yeah. wee gems and you know. The post always brought something interesting. Back then in the 90s honestly Kenny it was so experimental in this stuff they did. Yeah. Not just with what became yeah, Rebel Inc but also with payback and also with just individual books. They were yeah. so I mean it wasn't making money that much but it was just bringing out incredible works of you know non-fiction as well as fiction you know. Yeah. So it was a real, there's a real kind of uh, feeling that you're involved in something quite important. I was there for five years. Like, yeah. I was there from 1996 when I started the imprint, you know, the second stage of Rebel Inc, if you want, in Canningate. So mm -hmm. I was there for five years, four and a half years, and we did 52 books yeah. in that period. It's quite a lot for a small imprint, even now. It stands as a complete body of work. There's very few editors think in those terms because they're only thinking one book at a time. But I wanted people to buy one book of Rebel Inc and think, that's so good. I'm going to buy another one, it's going to be completely different, but I know there's going to be something connecting them up, both in quality-wise and in content. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was to build this body of work. Rebel Inc had a very visual aesthetic that was identifiable as Rebel Inc. You know, from day one, I wanted it to be black and white covers, which we kept going all the way through. Not all of them, but all the, the classics. And also the red and black logo, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's, a, it's an anarchist flag the red and black, the it was, I took that from the anarchist traditional black and red. Yeah. It wasn't planned to stop. What happened, you know, Rebel Inc at that time, this is by 2000, was massive. It was having a massive impact. And what happened, it affected the way I was working. 
Uh, my lifestyle became absolutely chaotic at that point. It was an amazing project and at the same time I was going to pieces a little bit. Uh, it was the end of the 90s, everybody was fucked in the 90s, so was I. And uh, there was a massive friction between myself, Jamie Bang and Canning Gate and it all kind of blew up in a really horrible way. Uh, so it kind of exploded, it just stopped. Myself and Jamie have spoken in the last few years and we've, you know, we've, we've chatted and everything and it's nice, you know, we're able to talk about this again in a really positive way and I feel very positive about what we did with Canning Gate and with Jamie. Uh, and I also feel that it stopped at 52 books and they were a good body of work, it didn't tail off. Yeah. So it kind of stopped at its very height yeah. and when I look back on it I think that's good, you know, Perfect. it's, it's not, it's not, it never went. It never sort of slowly declined or became dull. It just became, it was incredible, it was exciting, and then bang, the whole thing exploded. Yeah. And I like that as an ending. That's cool. That was that. <laughs>